Good evening, folks. It's Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project and Magnetic Reversal News, bringing you a Grand Solar Minimum Update Tuesday, May 12th, 10 p.m. Mountain Time, 2020. And that's not even funny. Check out the models. They're showing exactly what we predicted uh, almost five days ago now, a switch from cold in the east to cold in the west. The snow pattern will continue into May. Hey, hey. Heavy snow in the Sierras all the way up the, to the Cascades. Take, out, take a look at the snow in Idaho and western Montana, western Wyoming. And we just picked up a little snow yesterday down in our sec neck of the woods. But the big story, record cold. Record cold over the last 24 hours. Almost 5,000 recorded record cold temperatures. That's quite a few. But who knew that Al Gore was going to be hiding in his hole? Shut up, Al! Get in your hole! All right. Now, and it's not just the U.S. This is the last hour, just now, while I'm recording this. Take a look at Europe and Scandinavia. Even down here into the Middle East and God knows where that is. Record cold, record cold, record cold, record cold. Over the last hour, we only have three points in the East this hour, but 100, about 100 records in other parts of the globe. Keep calm. It's Grand Solar Minimum Update Time. Monday's snowfall breaks record for the latest snow accumulation ever in Cleveland. It broke a few records. The most ever and the latest ever. Because there never was any on this day. So any amount would have broken that. Did you just read that headline correct? Yes, you did. Snowfall records are not often talked about during the month of May. But here we are. As of May 11th, May 2020. It's official. Our sixth snowiest May on record with 0.2 inches of snowfall recorded at Cleveland Hopkins. That 0.2 inches of snowfall on the books for May 11th, this morning's snow, is the latest snowfall on record in Cleveland. And you thought nothing ever happened in Cleveland. New York City, Boston could break century-old cold weather records in just hours. Hours of cold powers. Can you see that all right? Is my chair blocking that? And notice how they say here, look at this. This is the dumb and dumber. This is how stupid they think you are. But warmer temperatures are coming. It, in New York and Boston, it's going to be the coldest in 100 years, but it's going to be warmer after that. Thank you, NBC. Thanks for telling us that. Now let's get back to how warm it actually is. And you're about to see a swarm of boom. Whoa! That doesn't look pretty warm. And that is the, now this is the um, map of all the records in the last 24 hours, hot and cold. And you will notice in the last 24 hours, not a single hot weather record was broken, but there were hundreds upon hundreds of cold weather records. And let's just watch this run through as far south as central Florida, all the way up north, which doesn't really matter. <laughs> Stormy stretch coming from the plains to the Midwest. It is spring, and ding, ding, the hail is going to be growing. And by the time we hit June 1st, we're going to be reporting on some big melons falling on someone's head, probably just east of Pikes Peak. Stormy weather conditions are likely over the next several days from the plains to the Mississippi Valley and to the Ohio Valley and Great Lakes. With severe thunderstorms and heavy rain, it will be insane. The concern through Thursday is severe weather across central and southern plains into the mid-Mississippi Valley with heavy rain and flooding from the mid-Mississippi Valley to the Ohio Valley and Great Lakes. Now let's check the map and the current warnings and watches. Those are frost and freeze warnings. All the way down to the southern tip of West Virginia. So click on your county if you're worried about your crops freezing. They should be covered. They should have been covered for the last few days. We have flood warnings and watches for southern Arkansas here. Oh, southern Missouri and northern Arkansas, my bad. And we have uh, winter weather advisories out here in western Kansas. Nothing coming up on radar. See that? Kansas is blank. But you should expect some lake effect snow, some moderate snow in that uh, region, in the Finger Lakes region. Up in the Adirondacks, a little bit of snow, a little bit of snow in Vermont. So that is all you're going to see over there in the northeast. And then the snow moves into the west with up to 24 inches predicted through the 20th of May 
in the Sierras. So we're going to be keeping a close eye on the Sierra snowpack. Now, have you heard about India? It was Windia. And insane. Massive dust storms strike Delhi, causing temperatures to plummet and dust to deposit everywhere. There was even some reported earthquakes from this event. It's like a, ho a, hoob a hoodoo, a haboob, one of those events. But clearly, I, oh, we've got some audio. Whoa, that was a bag. <laughs> and here's a boom. So give him a thumbs up over there at the Telegraph and subscribe like I just did. Wow, I didn't even know I wasn't subscribed. Imagine that. Now, big story coming out in seismicity. The low Ihi Seamount earthquake swarm gets USGS attention. I've been following this for 36 hours, hours of powers, and we're going to about to blow it up and see. just take a look at what it looks like as we enter the seismic update. There have been quite a few quakes of of note, including a 6.6 .6 in the Sol Solomon Islands just kicking off about eight hours ago. A moderate uptick on the West Coast. Where's this banger? Hello, Oklahoma. Yeah, frack related. We had a Tennessee quake about 36 hours ago in the New Madrid region, probably rumbling some nerves. But let's blow up the, the big island. And seismicity has been very active over the last, let's say, 72 hours. And we can also learn maybe a little bit about how to use the USGS website over here while we do it. As you can come up and on the island, what you're going to see is a string of seismicity, which is indicative of the deposition of the islands as a whole. And what I mean by this is this plate here, the Pacific plate, has been moving over a hot spot, and the hot spot has formed all of these islands. The current hotspot is right over here over the big island and a new hotspot soon right here. There's where the hotspot is. That's the hotspot. So the big island has moved away from it and now we'll be forming, guess what? Another island. Yes, there'll be another island sooner than many people think as the Loihi Seamount earthquake swarm ensues. Now this got kicked off during the eruption of Kilauea last year. But take a look at the amount of quakes just in the last 24 hours here. So here's the Pahala region and where that the fractures occurred and all those lava flows were happening a year ago. Here is the seismic swarm. Come over here and click on settings and go to, see this is one day magnitude 2.5. Let's just go to seven day 2.5. It's probably, <gasps> boom! And these aren't seven days. These were just yesterday. So this is the last 24 hours right here. Hours of powers. All above 2.5. If we put seven days all magnitude, it will melt my computer down. And it's going to tell me it's going to melt it down right about now. But we will continue anyway. And you can just see what's actually happening here. Give it a second. We're melting. I mean, it's just melting now. Continue anyway. We did it. We clicked it. Maybe we should have. Whoa. So you can see there is amazing amounts of uptick here at the Loho Ihi Seamount and also in the Pahala region. Could we see lava coming to the surface anytime soon? There is a there is a high probability. And what I mean by high, if we were looking at 100%, let's say a 20 to 30% probability that we could see either an eruption of the seamount or an eruption on the island. This is with, and Hawaii currently has some of the largest unemployment in the world because of this woo flu nonsense. And people are already starving. Can you imagine if lava starts flowing through their homes? Oh my goodness. Worldwide Volcano News Update. Uh, no volcanic activity of note. Standard activity, Reventador, 15,000. What else do we have? Popo, Semaru, Nevados de Chilan, Aso, Ibico. And let's just run through the list, see if we missed anything. No, nothing of significance. Popo, puffing to 19,000, so on and so forth. Come check it out yourself. The links will be below. Do your own homework. Now, let's get into an interesting 
segment in tonight's video. I'm sure I enjoyed researching it, and you will too. Strange hollow ball-like structures found in 80 million-year-old fossils. These are sea lilies, or crinoids. And scientists at the University of Western Australia and University of Cambridge have made a chance discovery in the UK Museum's collection. Already existing fossils in the drawers that have been forgotten to history. But some people are going and looking through them. I looked through every single drawer in our repository when I was at Temple University. Trust me. And what they found is that an unusual structure known as a buckyball made up of a series of hexagon and pentagons in two species, the Uinta crinus socialis, and let me just highlight that for you, the Uinta crinus socialis and the Marsupides testudinarius. These are two forms of crinoid, which are awesome creatures. Um, Many of you who don't know what I'm talking about, crinoids are sea lilies or sea fans. And I'm going to show you some live versions and some fossil versions. The most amazing fossil versions go back to the Devonian into the Ordovician, which is from about 500 million to 300 million years, some of the best fossils. This is one of those types of fossils. Um, they, they were responsible for some of the first jewelry because the columnal stems break off in these little circles which are very uh, common in any fossil assemblage. So if you're going fossil hunting, the odds of you finding a crinoid stem columnal, which is what this is called, a columnal, a single piece of the stem. See here you have one, two, couple columnals here and a, a string of a stem. Yeah. So these columnals were used as beads. And if we can get you a picture here of maybe what the creature looked like, you'll have a better idea. Okay, so here you see the stem. And these are the crinoid columnals. So if you break one off and you look down on it, it has pentameral symmetry. Completely amazing. Blow your mind like a starfish. This is the calyx, probably a soft part. And these are the pinules or the, the feathers of the sea fan. Now, sea fans are live creatures that attach themselves to corals and stuff. And prolific in the fossil record. Let's see if we can see, get some more pictures here. Okay, so here we come over to crinoid evolution, the evolution of crinoidea. Now, for those of you that are interested, today approximately 600 living species of crinoidea are known. Most free-living feather stars or camachulids living in the shallow seas. About 80 species of stalked sea lilies are restricted to the deeper water of today's ocean. Watch. Deep sea crinoids attached to a sponge at 1,200 feet. We're going to get to there, but let's real quick talk about the live structure. There's the cup, the pinules I talked about, the soft body parts that have been preserved for hundreds of millions of years, the arms, the crown, the stalk, and the calyx. And this is what a fossil looks like up here in this corner. So really excellent uh, articles here for you to come look at if you collect fossils. And then we'll just come down here and look at some live footage of sea lilies or crinoids in the deep ocean that still exist. Now, these creatures have been around through mass extinction after mass extinction. They made it through all the big ones. Even the Triassic Jurassic, they went missing, but somehow came back out of nowhere. So this is speaks volumes to the resilience of biology on planet Earth, period. I mean, and let's go look at some of that phylogenic data that shows that. So here we can see the chart and the emergence of the crinoid here at the end of the Cambrian period, an explosion during the Ordovician, and then a, a neck point here at the Ordovician Silurian boundary, mass extinction, and then a regrowth and a proliferation through the Silurian Devonian extinction and the birth of fishes. And then a little pinch point, and look at the missing data, the Permian Triassic. During the Permian Triassic, there was um there are no fossil assemblages or just a very thin line. Just a very few fans made it, and then another explosion. And where we are today is probably not the largest assemblage of species, but because it's modern times. It appears that way. It's just that we haven't found 
There's just not enough people looking in the Ordovician for species of Crinoidea. Trust me, I'm one of the few. <laughs> so I hope you got something out of that. Here is a Konservat Lagerstadt. Konservat Lagerstadt is a German term, which means extreme preservation of all soft body parts. It takes a year almost to expose a specimen like this with fine tools and acid etching and a bathing and on and on. But you can, we can actually reveal some of the beauty from 380 million years ago in this detail. Mind blowing. Oh yeah, that is a boom. More booms coming. Humans created the earliest modern artifacts in Europe, not Neanderthal. Well, we are, we're the greatest. And I don't know if really what this is about, but an international team of researchers has discovered and dated the remains of Homo sapiens and associate, associated artifacts in a cave, a Baco Kido in Bulgaria. And just some of these amazing artifacts, 45,000-year-old bear tooth pendants and other tooth pendants. These people were total badasses. They had some amazing uh, bone tools here, 45,000 years old, and stone tools. I've never seen a bifacial six inches long like this with no tool marks. They literally had to find it this way. Amazing tools and technology 45,000 years ago, including jewelry in the form of bear tooth pendants. And other claws and other awesome predatory jewelry that these humans wore. Now, as the food supply chain breaks down due to the forced pandemic of the Huflu, we citizens were meant to suffer on purpose so that they can control us even more, force vaccines, give you, well, barcodes on your forehead, God knows where we're going. But as you learn to hate your neighbor and social distance six feet from other humans, and we do otherwise here in my, my region, I predicted to several of my close colleagues that this is not going to be a bad thing. It's going to get people away from $26 a pound meat in the supermarket that's bad for you because it was um, – raised on a feedlot and go back to nature, go back to small-scale farming. It's going to be a boon for small-scale farming. There has been a small-scale farming boon over the last three to five years. And I was part of it. I, as soon as I got out here, I was one of the newest members of the farmer's market, so on and so forth. And new farms were popping up everywhere, just as we predicted. And this pandemic is making it even better. There are CSA selling out that have never sold out before, farms that have increased production like we have here tenfold, and we're going to be able to supply 50 CSAs a week for free. And I'm about to place an ad in the paper in about a month to anyone that is in need. We're not selling our CSAs at the Oppenheimer Ranch Project. We're going to be giving them to 50 families in need, and I'm going to personally drive them out, and they can pick them up in the back of the truck. We're going to be spending hours harvesting these crops for these families. We might even set up a booth in town, if we're allowed, and give away food for free. Stay tuned for those updates. But as the food supply chain breaks down, and fear mongers say there's going to be no more meat and you're all going to die, get your head out of your... <whistles> the supermarket and the meat in there, the only good meat is the organic meat, and you usually can't buy it. You can't purchase it, but for 6 or $7 a pound from a local farmer, you can buy a quarter of a whole animal, and your whole fridge will be filled for a whole year. So there are definite alternatives to the mainstream food supply, which is tainted, poisoned, and disgusting, in my personal opinion. And if you just do a five minutes worth of research on factory farming, you might vomit as well. <laughs> so buy local. Know who your farmer is. Get food directly from the source. We have pork, we have eggs, and we have a plethora of greens and vegetables that we produce at 7,000 feet in the middle of nowhere where no one has been farming. We came here to tell people that we were to, here to farm and they looked at us like we were insane. Well, the proof is in the pudding. In the last 
five years, we've probably produced 20,000 pounds of crops for food for humans. And that's a fact. Large chunks of a Chinese rocket missed New York City by 15 minutes. Just about an hour after I put this video up, or at the same time, or maybe an hour before, yesterday, this object had already hit Earth, thankfully. Missed New York by 15 minutes and fell somewhere 20 degrees west and 20 degrees north latitude, just north of the Canary Islands off of Africa. Now, within 30 minutes of the window that they gave for this object's reentry, it moved three quarters of the way around the world. That's how dangerous this object was. Coming in hot, coming in horizontally, so it's gone in the atmosphere before it drops down. Absolutely insane. And it flew over New York City at probably 10,000 miles an hour and crashed into the Atlantic, thankfully, before it hit the coast of Africa. So you want to know more? A week ago, China launched the newest version of its largest rocket, the Long March B, from its southernmost spaceport. Well, because of this rocket design, its large core stage reached orbit after the launch, detached, and then fell back to Earth. Yep. And this left a large core stage with a mass slightly in excess of 20 tons in an orbit with an average of who cares. But the point is that no one died and no cities were destroyed. Good news. Keep an eye on the sky. Better news. If you're up early in the morning and I don't have the data up, but we're going to do a video soon, probably tomorrow during the closest approach of Comet Swan. This is the close approach. It's going to go right past the ecliptic and right past Earth. So here's Earth tomorrow or now, probably now when I'm talking. <laughs> but the point is that it's going to now come above the northern ecliptic. So if you're in the northern hemisphere, we're going to be able to start to see Swan. It's only in a mag 5.4, which is very dim. And if you don't live in a place like I do, you won't be able to see it without a binoc or a telescope. But if you look up into Pisces around 4 or 5 a.m. north, northeast, you may see a bizarre green glow called Comet Swan. Comet Swan also has its own Twitter. I want to point that out. You can follow it. Updates. They're doing a great job here updating every hour or so. So follow Comet Swan. Has more followers than I do, for fuck's sake. Jesus. We just found this thing a few weeks ago. According to Comet Swan itself on Twitter, I am visible to the naked eye. I am 85,073,554 kilometers away from Earth. My current magnitude is 5.4. Al Gore is a bore. Doesn't say that. You can spot me near Pisces. Please retweet and spread the word. Hashtag Comet. Hashtag Comet C2020 F8. Hashtag Comet Swan. Hashtag Boom. Hashtag I hope you got something out of the video. Share this with like-minded people. We love each and every one of our one-time donors, our Patreons, our viewers, our subscribers, our haters, our non-subscribers, and everyone else. The most important person to the channel is the person that shares this video on their social media. Maybe to get some of those sheep ah, to hear something, and then there'll be a, a popping noise. And it just might be their head coming right out of their ass. We love each and every one of you. Be safe. Plant a seed. I'm getting tanned quick. Either that or skin cancer. <laughs>